Hey everybody, Izzy here, getting ready to jump into episode number 17. That's right, episode number 17 of another effing podcast. Got a great guest in studio, Dan Epstein, talking about his brand new book. We're going to talk some music stuff too, because he used to contribute to Rolling Stone. So I got a few bones to pick with him, but... We'll get into that in a little bit. First, if you want to take care of the show, check out rockstarleatherworks.com. Badass leather bands and watches. You'll buy one. You'll want to buy more. Trust me on this. I got one. I want another one really, really, really bad. Very, very cool stuff. Rockstarleatherworks.com. Check out Hairball. That would be hairballonline.com. Check out all the dates coming towards you. And, of course, the KISS podcast. That's right. Three Sides of the Coin. Check those guys out, too. Always got a great, great KISS episode every week. And, of course, if you do want to contribute to the show, PayPal, izzy.presley at gmail.com. Help support this shit show, I guess you could say. <laughs> uh, any any amount helps. Dollar, five dollars, hundred bucks, whatever you want to do. It's all good with me. Just listen. That's fine, too. All right. Coming up next, Dan Epstein on another effing podcast. You kids with your loud music and your Dan Fogelberg, your Zima, hula hoops, and Pac-Man video games, don't you see people today have attention spans that can only be measured in nanoseconds? Hey everybody, Izzy Presley here, episode number 17, another effing podcast. Joined in studio, please welcome to the Hurt Locker, Mr. Dan Epstein. Hi! How you doing, man? Well, thanks for being here. It's weird, because we are friends on Facebook, and I didn't even realize we were friends on Facebook, and our mutual friend Brian's like, dude, you should have Dan on your show. I'm like, okay, who's Dan? He's like, no, man, he's got a book coming out, it's going to be awesome. I'm like, oh shit, all right, I'll... I'll, I'll Google him. Oh shit, we're already friends. Kick ass. That works out great. Uh, Dan, let's go through your resume a little bit. You've been writing for a long, long time. Yeah, professionally been writing about twenty years. Twenty years, and you've were you a contributor to Rolling Stone or were you like a staff writer? Oh no, I've always been uh, with Rolling Stone. I've always been a contributor. Okay. I, I, I make no editorial decisions. Okay. Okay. Right, well, that's good. That's good, because I have a bone to pick with Rolling Stone magazine. But, and I'm sure you know it all stems down to one band, and that would be Kiss. Well, I want to get get into this Kiss thing a little bit. Did you catch any of the um, any of the acceptance speeches? Yeah, I did, actually. I, I uh, you know, seen them on YouTube and, and, and all that. I, you know, I thought, uh, you know, they, they were Oh, it was very frustrating as a Kiss fan, and you're a Kiss fan, oh, absolutely. absolutely. And I, I guess uh, I, I didn't see. I, I just saw the, like the speeches, but I guess like the thing that they had playing before they came on, like Paul's makeup was backwards, and and they like concentrated on like the marketing and the toys and all this stuff. And it's like almost like them slapping Kiss in the face. Right. Yeah, and I wonder how much of that had to do with Kiss not performing. Yeah, I don't know. You know, it's, uh, I mean, you talk about having a bone to pick with Rolling Stone. I mean, I think the bigger bone, obviously they're related, but the bigger bone is with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Well, right, right. But isn't, you, well, Jan's kind of like the whole, the head of that whole thing, though, isn't he? Yeah, absolutely. But I, but I think, actually, you know, Rolling Stone, the magazine, still does some stuff Right. With their political coverage and things like that. Mm -hmm. But the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I think, is just pretty much bullshit at this point. Yeah. And uh, I think Paul made a good point during his speech. He, I don't know if you guys listened to it. Maybe I'll post him. Um, but he's like, the voting should be in the hands of the people that are the listeners, right. you know? Like they're, they're the ones who buy the records. They're the, mm -hmm. they're the ones who come to the shows. And the people who are on the board of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame 
are not the same people. Right. Do you have a vote? No, absolutely not. Okay. You, you really, I mean, I, I have a good friend who has a vote. Right. But, like, literally, out of all the people I know in the industry, like, he's the one. It's a very small body. And isn't, it's like a lot of old people, too, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. People and uh, you know, and and they uh, and they all have their own agendas. I mm-hmm. mean, this friend of mine who I love and agree with on most stuff, like he's always got this one artist that, like, you know, it's always like, yeah, this year I'm going to try to, you know, get so right. in, and you know, and, and and that's cool. But it's just, but it really does seem like it's it's very bound up in you know this quote unquote credibility on one hand, you know, when it comes to older artists. And then they can put shit like Red Hot Chili Peppers in because right. like they're desperate to like still make it relevant to a younger mm-hmm. crowd. So it just it, it makes no sense. It's like you're gonna you're gonna leave uh, you know you, you're not even gonna bring Thin Lizzy in for consideration as you're wearing a Thin Lizzy shirt, which is major. Yes, uh, you know one of my all time favorite bands. Like they're never gonna get to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but Red Hot Chili Peppers are there. Right. Right. And, and, like, tell me that Red Hot Chili Peppers were more influential a band than War was. And War had hits. They did. But it's just, but they're not relevant, you know, quote unquote relevant to, uh, you know, to, to the younger generation. So they, they, it's not as important. I was, I was really shocked that LL Cool J didn't get in. I, I figured he would be one of those token acts that they put in to, you know, to keep it relevant. You know, to the uh, and along with NWA, right. because they're—I mean, I'm not a rap fan, but you know, they were very revolutionary, and yeah, you know, absolutely, and you know, and and and, and then that that opens up a whole other can of worms. It's like, what is rock and roll? Right. And there's Miles Davis belong in there. Does you know, Public Enemy? You know, it's like, you know, and on the one hand, those guys had more quote unquote rock and roll attitude than mm-hmm. you know most of the bands who were who were up for it, but. You know, it's 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 just been so nebulous and so poorly uh, kind of run and conceived from the beginning that you know it's just it's really just gotten worse. At least in the beginning, you were getting in the obvious people like you know, mm-hmm. the Beatles and the Stones and the Kinks and the Who and the King and, and yeah, yeah yeah you know like and uh, but but there were, even then there are still people missing and uh, you know it's like and where did the, the one hit wonders go and you know it's it's like you know so much of rock and roll and this is what's interesting about kiss getting in and the whole controversy about them getting in it's that so much about rock and roll is not about you know quote-unquote credibility Mm -hmm. not about you know um like playing to the critics it's you know it's about you know it's like louis louis the kingsman like this great just one-off single by this you know, a band that really wasn't that great. Uh, right. But, you know, all the elements came together for, you know, two minutes and 25 seconds and produced, you know, one of the greatest singles ever recorded. Mm-hmm. So it's like, to me, that is more deserving of being in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame than, I don't know. Um, Madonna. Madonna, yeah. Perfect example. I mean, she's she is badass, but... She, she had a great, great run... She certainly was influential in her time, but it, uh, yeah, I mean, it's like before we get, you know, before we start working in all the 80s dance divas, right? Let's, let's do justice to the bands of the 60s and 70s. You know, it's almost, it, 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 I guess the, the, the phrase rock and roll hall of fame, I mean, that sets a precedent, and then it's really more of a musician's hall of fame it, now, technically. Right. But, you know, and, and I don't know if you saw Daryl Hall's speech. I did not. Uh, <laughs> like, fix this shit now. Well, you know what got him in the mustache. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's that's uh, you know that, there's a lot of power in that mustache. Why do you think that Kiss was ignored for so long? Well, I think I think Kiss were uh, you know they were never a critics band. Right, and right. Rolling Stone was you know uh, you know kicking the shit out of them from the beginning, just like treating them as a hype, as a joke. Mm-hmm. So, so I think that that 
kind of element or you know attitude towards them has always you know you know hovered over them and i think um you know i think that's been very obvious uh to of all people you know gene simmons and paul stanley right and you know to to varying degrees they've made their peace with that but uh yeah I i think it's just like i mean there's still so many people who are like oh man kiss got in like what a joke like Right. Slapped on a bunch of makeup and completely ignoring the fact that these guys wrote, you know, 20 or 30 of the great, you know, hard rock songs. Absolutely. And that's the thing is like, you know, they had the show, but if it wasn't for the soundtrack to that show, that show would have been shit. Right. You know, there are a lot of bands of that era who had shows. Right. Like, you know, brought out uh, all kinds of uh, props or pyro or whatever. And it's like, yeah. I am um, right up to where the pictures start. That's about yeah. that's about how far I am. Because he talks in there about how uh, you know Bill Alcoin, their manager, mm-hmm. started like signing all these other bands, and Bill Alcoin's attitude was like, if we get you know if we can get each of these bands, each of the, these bands a cool logo, mm-hmm. we got it made. Right. And Paul is just like like you know what do you mean like like all we needed was a cool logo? That's <laughs> bullshit. You know, like, <laughs> right. So much more to kiss than having. That just gives Ace more credit because he created that logo. <laughs> damn it! That's right. Well, unless you talk to Paul, right? He did it. Right. <laughs> well, it, it's funny. I mean, you, you've read all four books. Yeah, uh, Which one? Wrote, wrote uh, piece for Rolling Stone comparing bits, uh, you know, certain uh, stories and uh-huh. how each of them, uh, you know, tell it. Which is your favorite one? You know, I really like the Paul one. I, okay. And, and, I, and I have to say, it's not just because it's the most recent one. Ever. Right. learning a lot more about him than I can right. the, the other one. You know, because he's always been the m- most mysterious one. Right, absolutely. Even though he's the front man, mm-hmm. he's always been sort of, you know, very guarded. And it's like, Ace, you knew what you were getting when you bought the Ace book. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know you know what I loved about the Ace book, though? I was reading it, and I was imagining him narrating it to me, so I was pissing myself because of because it's Ace, yeah. you know? Like, like, that would be the ultimate book on tape. Oh, Absolutely. Right. He's just, I mean, the guy's just like you know got such great comic timing, and he's you know. Oh, absolutely. I interviewed him once, and it was just like you know it was a video interview, and I was off camera, and it was all I could do to not laugh hysterically right. the entire time because you know I had to sort of like do it with my mouth open. Uh huh. Made it sound just like you know just because uh, he uh, you know he's hysterical, but uh, you no, know, I lo- I love the Ace one actually. You know. The, I, I like a lot of the Peter one. I, you know, after a while, you, you can't help but feeling like, you know, he's really just fucked a lot of things up for himself. Oh, yeah. And he's kind of a whiny bitch about Well, it. yeah, but he owned it, too, though. It's like, you know, he's like, this shit happened, but it was, it, yeah, it was my fault. Yeah, I, I, I know what you say. A lot of people think he was, like, whining, but I was like, I think he was owning it more than he was whining. Well, I, But I think there is a, a lot of uh, there, there's still some self delusion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's self delusion in all of the books, especially Gene's. Oh well, yeah, and and Gene was like the most predictable and least enjoyable right. of them all because it's just like you know I'm a genius and mm-hmm. so I'm a genius and uh, you know and and it's like um, he had one great idea in his life and that was Kits right. And Everything else he's been able to do has come out of that idea. That's, mm-hmm. that, that's you know that was a genius idea, but nothing else he's done is particularly genius at all. Well, according to him, everything else he has done is particularly genius. But that's just how Gene rolls. Um, the other thing that I want to throw in there is like that's interesting about reading the Paul book is that like you really see how much tension there has been at times between right. Paul and Gene. And, and like, I mean, talk about an odd couple. It's like you have this this one guy who's really kind of, he's introverted and he's very sensitive, except when he gets on stage. 
and like you know who, who starts going to therapy like on his own dime when he's like right. 18 and then you know his his you know partner in business in music for 40 some odd years is this guy who basically like revels in having no inner life whatsoever and it's just like you know it's just about sex it's about money it's you know it's just like that's that's gene and yep. Paul is like you know mr like you know well this you know i felt abandoned and you know and so so I, that that to me is one of the most fascinating undercurrents of Paul's world. and you know all this shit with the rock and roll hall of fame too it's like ace was saying i watched his interview with Artie lang he's like paul pretty much runs everything right now Gene just does his business stuff, and it's almost like it was in the '80s, except they're making a lot more money now. Um, I think it's kind of like the, you know, like the, how the Stones kind of got in the '80s, you know, where like you know, Mick, you know, Keith was distracted, obviously for different reasons. Right. Was distracted, but it's sort of like, all right, like, you know, I'm going to keep this thing running. And, right. You know, and then like both Keith and Gene come back to their respective bands, and like, you know, what are we doing? And then both Mick and Paul are just like, fuck you guys. Like I've been taking care of business here and now, like, right now you want in and 50% and yeah. So do you think that was probably Paul's decision then not to, uh, not to play with the original band? <sighs> That's a good question. I think, it was, I think Paul and Gene both, I think, I think there's, you know, I've, I've never talked to Paul, but I've interviewed Gene a couple of times and there is still so much like real resentment below the surface towards Peter and Ace. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like, like the first time I interviewed Gene, I brought along a, a 1976 issue of Cream Magazine with, uh, where they're all dressed up in, like, Santa. Uh, yeah, yeah. Christmas issue. You know, so I had him autograph the cover. And, you know, and at the, this, this is, like, 2003. So we're talking, like, 27 years after that photo was taken. I put the cover in front of Gene, and he just, like, and, and, this is after what had been a very pleasant, funny interview. He just like went off. He was just like, Ace was so fucking drunk that day. And just like, like it's still so present. With right. Him. And, you know, and you really get the sense, and I think from reading Paul's book too, that, um, you know, those guys worked their asses off to, to make Kiss happen. And both Peter and Ace, you know, essentially left. You know, yeah. And Gene's, Gene's line to me was like, you know, all those guys had to do was wear the makeup, you know, show up for the shows, and like everything would have been great, you know. And, and I think that's an oversimplification. Right. Kiss would have had commercial difficulties regardless of whether those guys had stuck around. But the, um, but I think, I mean, you've been in bands, right? Yes, I have. Okay. So you know what it's like, 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 uh, you know, uh, when you work your ass off in band and then there's some guy also in the band who like shows up when he feels like it lifts equipment when he feels like it and yet for whatever reason everybody thinks that's the cool guy in the band right and so like you know so the fact that gene and and paul have done so much and yet the fans are still like oh ace ace was the rock and roll man you know like that just that burns them to this day well it's I think it really is like that, though, because I think Ace and Peter were the rock stars. Gene and Paul, I mean, Gene was, you know, the business guy. Paul was just, you know, the front man. He was there. I think, you know, the true rock stars in that band were Ace and Peter. I mean, they lived the lifestyle, obviously. But, I mean, you know, but certainly all four of them as showmen. Right. They all had their things. Oh, absolutely. uh, You know, but but to, to feel like, you know, like the fans won't accept your band as complete unless you bring these two fuck ups back like you know i get it i i i, I want to see those fuck ups back as well absolutely I also understand why they would be right well well you know i mean my thing is is like i don't want a full-blown reunion tour i don't it, that's over it's right. done you know we get that we know i mean we as oh absolutely and it was awesome and it was awesome but i mean my thing is i mean i i don't like the makeup being worn now and Mm-hmm. there in in the ace makeup like you know they thought long and hard before doing that and you know they you know gene and paul definitely got a kick on some level about like, you know that, what a knife twist that would be for well them. according to ace he is licensing his makeup to them so they have every right to do it yeah. okay. With, and i think that licensing agreement 
ends soon, from what he was saying. I don't know. I, you know, I, I, I put. Pull- yeah, that's what I was. That's what I was getting at. There was um, what. Uh, what, do you think the fans? I, I posted this on Facebook a while ago. Do you think the fans would have been this pissed off if he was in Vinny's makeup? No, no, I'm not at all. Right. I think because I don't think anybody could like. Yeah, I mean, Vinny, Vinny was in that makeup for what, like a year? Right. And and I don't think fans connected with him in that same way. You know, anywhere near the, the way they connected with me. And I tell you what, I mean, Kiss, personally, it almost seems like they are the biggest dysfunctional family in the world because it's like they're apart and they hate each other. Then all of a sudden they get back in the same room together and they're best friends again. Right. Well, I think there's always some level of, you know, and and you can see that at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame thing, that there is still some level of affection there. and. You know, I mean, it's 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 kind of like that that thing, like when you play on a team with somebody, or you you know you you serve in the military with somebody. It's like there's always going to be this bond, regardless right. of you know you, how you actually are with each other as people. Yeah, I I don't know. I just I just want them to get along. <laughs> I just want one more show. That's all I want. One well, more show. I well, mean, that- and and it would have been great to have to have that at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Con- the other thing uh i read somebody suggest this that that would have been cool in its own way would have been for gene and paul to say fuck you to the rock and roll hall of fame right and just go like like oh what we're good enough to let in now you know like screw you guys and this is why and you know i think that would have done shitloads for their you know quote-unquote credibility right and would have you know gotten the the fan base fired up and you know i I think uh i i i think on some level though those guys always wanted to be long so i don't think that ever would have happened i well i think gene deep down inside he's not going to come out and publicly say it but he's reveling in the fact that they're in the rock and roll hall of fame right now you know and it I love it. Ace just came on and said, dude, I think this is great. Yeah. We belong here. I mean, yeah. this is awesome. You know, and Gene and Paul, it's like you watch them on Twitter and watch them just bitch at fans. And, <laughs> and fuck you, <laughs> Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Blah, 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 blah. We'll go and accept, but that's it. And right. it's like, bullshit. You love it and you know it. Yeah. Um, Dan has a book. It's called uh, Stars and Strikes. Baseball in... Baseball in America in the Bicentennial Summer of 76. Okay, we're going to get into that in a second, but you know, as our segue before we get into a song, there's something that's been bugging the shit out of me. The national anthem at sports games and people singing like uh. singing it like they're trying out for American Idol. <laughs> How do we stop this? Well, and it's and it's gotten worse because now they uh, a lot of places do the uh, or have been for the past decade or so doing the um oh uh, uh uh, America the Beautiful, right? Uh, during the seventh inning stretch, which means more of this uh, on, on top of it. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I, I went to a Dodgers game um, last week, I think it was, and and yeah, it, and it was like not only was the girl singing like singing as if she was on American Idol, but she was also dressed like it. She had like oh, you know man. this this like you know f- form fitting dress and you know, with like a crop top blouse and it's just like, you know, and like perfectly done hair. And like my girlfriend was giving me shit like, oh yeah, you don't like that. I was like, well, it's not Duh. a pro, right. But it's, but like, but <laughs> right. in a way it pisses me off because it's just like, look, this is not about you. Like, right. you know, wear a fucking Dodger jacket and walk to the exactly. plate. You know, like, you know, it was good enough for Linda Ronstadt in the 1970s. It's good enough for you. You know, it's funny because I covered the twins for oh, about five years and one season, I think I missed two home games because I was living in, in Minneapolis at the time and on unemployment. So I was able to cover the games because I wasn't getting paid for that. So, <laughs> But I got to go cover the games. And you could always tell when the anthem was going to go long, even before they started singing. And there was once that they cut her off. <laughs> she held that. I mean, she it, it, it was like almost three or four minutes. And it's like, geez, come on, just sing the fucking song. I mean, get it over with. And she's holding it last note. They cut her off. It's fucking golden. <laughs> All right, we're going to play a song for you right now called 8-Track Stereo. This is a band called The Odd Fathers, and I think, Dan, you're really going to enjoy this. Um, 
This comes off of their brand new record called Volume One. It was produced by Jack Douglas. That's a good sign. And uh, it's, it's, I mean, they, they call themselves new classic rock because they're all old, <laughs> but it just kicks ass. And they, every time they get together, as Bryn was saying, that every time they get together to just jam, they, they say, we're not going to write songs. They just end up writing songs. It's just. <laughs> That was the Odd Fathers eight track stereo off of Volume One. Get that on iTunes. Look it up. Go buy it. You will absolutely love it. In here, in the Hurt Locker, is Dan Epstein. His brand new book is called Stars and Strikes: Baseball in America. In the bicentennial, bicentennial summer. Bicentennial summer of nineteen seventy six. What was it about nineteen seventy six that just kind of drew you to it? Oh, so much, man. I mean, just like from a baseball perspective, it's huge. It's uh, it's not only the season where Mark Fidrich comes out of nowhere and has this fantastic rookie year and just like captures the popular imagination, 
But it's also the kind of end of the line for the Oakland A's, who were uh-huh. kind of like the dynastic team of the 70s. Uh, Charlie Finley, their owner, dismantles them in the face of, uh, of oncoming full-scale free agency. It's the last year before, the, uh, before free agency kicks in. So it's, it's a, as just in terms of economic transition, it's huge. Like, you know, if you want to understand why ball players have such hyperinflated salaries today, you got to look back to 1976 to see okay. where the craziness all started. Um, it's the year where the Yankees returned to the postseason for the first time since the Johnson administration. Um, it's the second World Series in a row won by the Big Red Machine, which was really the other great team of the mm-hmm. 70s. Um, it's the year where the Phillies and the Royals kind of all of a sudden become contenders and, you know, will be so for, you know, the next decade on and off. Um, it's it's the year where George Steinbrenner really kind of, ta- he'd been suspended for a couple of years because of uh, illegal donations to the Nixon uh, re-election <laughs> campaign. So, but he comes back in 76 and really like starts the whole Bronx Zoo right. craziness. Uh, you know, he's got, hires Billy Martin. Um and uh, hilarity ensues. Uh, Bill Veck buys the White Sox for the second time, and you know, uh, re- you know, reignites uh, you know the Chicago's fondness for the franchise with all kinds of crazy promotions. That wasn't the shorts year, was it? That was the shorts. That year. was the shorts. That was year. one. Of, so you know, so so he's, he runs the White Sox out there in shorts for three games, which <laughs> no White Sox fan will ever be able to get out of their minds. Right. Uh, you know, the image of Goose Gossage taking them out <laughs> in shorts. Uh, they should really have their shorts in the Hall of Fame. I don't know why they don't. Um, and uh, Ted Turner takes over. That's the year he takes over the Braves oh, and really? does all kinds of crazy shit there. He, you know, has all these promotions, uh, ostrich races, and <laughs> uh, you know, um, at one point they have uh, uh, what they call a headlock and wedlock night, which is it was originally supposed to be a home plate wedding uh, promotion where a bunch of couples get married at the plate before the game, but they accidentally double booked it with a wrestling. <laughs> Uh, thing. <laughs> so they had the, they had a wedding at home plate before the game, and then they had uh, uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling afterwards. So headlock oh, and wedlock. That is hilarious. So you know, it's just all kinds of stuff, stuff like that. The the uh, the Red Sox are uh, you know they're coming off they're you know winning the pennant the year before, but they they're having problems. And at one point, a Boston radio sa- station hires a Salem witch to remove like whatever curse has been placed on them, and you know just just all kinds of really nutty things that have you know some which people remember a lot of which people have kind of forgotten about it almost seems like um not not minor league but like you know the minnesota has the st paul saints and sure. it's, the, it's like it's, Mike uh, yeah, yeah it's almost like indie league stuff yeah it's what it, it's what it feels like well it was you know i mean it was much freer and crazier in in the 70s you know mm-hmm. with, i mean really in everything but um you know, there wasn't this sort of like very rigid where like, you know, Major League Baseball has to approve everything that happens. Right. And, you know, I mean, at the time, the two leagues were completely American League and National League were run by completely different people. So they didn't even agree on anything. So like, you know, getting them all to go, OK, well, we'll, you know, do X amount of T-shirt giveaways or whatever. It didn't work like that then. The um you know, it, it was really more of an anything goes kind of thing. Um, Charlie Finley uh, uh, hired an astrologer for the A's to help his manager make out the most uh, <laughs> astrologically compatible lineup. I mean, you know, wow. you, you, just, you don't hear about anything like that happening these days. But there were there, were, uh, you know, 1976 was just, you know, just brimming with this kind of craziness. Now, you brought up Mark the Bird Fidrich. Um he wasn't around that long. No, he actually didn't even. He came up as a as a rookie that season, um, but he only pitched twice in like April and early May. He didn't even get his first start till May fifteenth. Okay, and he still wound up winning nineteen games. Uh, you know, had a two thirty four and run average. Um, really, just just uh, I mean, you know, the things. News spread so differently in the mid-70s right. as opposed to now. Now it's like, 
you get like one or two games of Mark Fidrich talking to the ball and dropping to his knees to smooth out the tracks in the mound and shaking hands with his infielders every time they made a good play. Like that would be <laughs> all over Sports Center, right? And you know, and and you know, by by his fifth start, like we would all know everything about him, and we'd actually be kind of sick about him, but right. sick of him. But at this point. You know, in 1976, it was this kind of word of mouth thing. I mean, I, I was growing up in Ann Arbor, Michigan at the time. So, like, you know, it was this sort of thing where after he made his first start, like, there were these sort of rumbles. Like, like did you hear about the guy who pitched for the Tigers the other night? You know, stuff, stuff like this. And then it's not really till the end of June where he makes his, quote-unquote, national debut. He's pitching on Monday Night Baseball against the Yankees. Now, just to pause you for a second, there's I don't think a lot of people from this generation realize what that was. That There was one night of baseball a week. Yeah. And it was like it was like Monday Night Football, except it was Monday Night Baseball. It wasn't you didn't get all the home games. You didn't get all that shit. It was once. Right. Well, you got game of the week yeah. on the weekend. And, you know, and if you were lucky to live in a city or near a city that televised its t- some of its team's home games, you might, you know, it's like like in Ann Arbor, we would get the occasional Tigers game on mm-hmm. TV, usually weekends. Um, you know, the, the Braves were kind of uh, under Ted Turner were the first team to really broadcast most of their games. Right. Uh, but yeah, in the mid seventies, it was just like, you, you took what you got and you were glad for it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So anyways, continue with, uh, the Mr. Fidrich. So, so, you know, Mark Fidrich, you know, so by now there's this huge buzz on him. It's like, wow, there's this crazy guy who talks to the baseball and, you know, it's like, and he looks like big bird from Sesame street and, and he's pitching for the tigers who completely suck. But every time he takes them out for them, they win. So he, goes up against the Yankees who pretty much from out of the gate have been leading the American League East and uh, all season and really tough team you know it's like Thurman Munson Chris Shambliss this is pre Reggie Jackson right but the um, you know but it's a really solid uh, uh, group of players and they come into De- to Detroit uh, to pull, to play against the Tigers and Fidrich on Monday Night Baseball, and Fidrich totally shuts him down. I mean, they get a they get a home run off him, but like he makes the rest of it look easy. Like you know, I think the game goes for less than two hours. Yeah, wow. Yeah, he's just you know really efficient worker, and and the Monday Night Baseball audience sees this guy, and yeah, and he's like he's like running to the mound at the beginning of the inning and he's running to the dugout at the end or at the end of it and he's got these like you know huge golden curls and they're flying and he's this gawky 63 bean pole and his elbows are flying in every direction and every time one of his teammates makes a great play he like runs over and shakes their hand and slaps them on the back and you know he's just like he's just radiating so much joy and enthusiasm. I mean, I say it was like, you know, I was playing Little League Baseball at the time, and like that, watching Fidrich was like watching you and your friends because right. he's he's as happy to be out there as you are to be out, you know, on the diamond after school. And uh, and people just, you know, just fell in love with him. And, and at that game, after, after it's all over, um, that they, uh, you know, this this was before the practice of fans calling players out for curtain calls, right? And you know, but but the fans at Tiger Stadium, like fifty thousand people are in there, like they won't go home until he comes out. And one of his uh, teammates, Rusty Staub, has to convince him to put his clothes back on and go out. And you can see the video on YouTube of of when he comes out for the post game interview and to, to to kind of you know wave to the fans, and the love and applause and screaming is so intense like you see it like he almost falls over it's so powerful and uh it's just a beautiful beautiful moment i got goosebumps just (laughs) just talking about it but but so from from that point on he becomes this like national hero this pop idol really he's right he's like like as hot as the the fonz Dorothy Hamill and Bruce Jenner rolled into one. It's just like he, he's everywhere. And so much so that when when the Tigers go on the road, general managers from other teams ask them to rejigger their rotation so that he will pitch in their park because they know if he takes Sell them tickets. out, that's good for like 20,000 more tickets. 
and uh, and yeah, and and the Tigers, I think, I forget the exact uh, amount, but he, the Tigers, wound up like fourth or fifth in overall attendance that year, and this is with a lousy team, right? But almost all of it is through Fidrich and through through the games that he pitches. And, so there was nobody in the stands unless he was pitching, pretty much, right? Pretty much, and and I know this for a fact because I went to some games that year when he wasn't pitching. Right, and you could walk like on a Sunday game, you could walk up to the ballpark, buy tickets behind home plate for you know four fifty. Yep, and just walk right in, no problem. Yeah, that's like those lean years in the nineties at the Metrodome too. Yeah, it's absolutely. Like, <laughs> you know, just a sea of blue seats. And Teflon and 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 and, and the carpet death like silence. Yeah, and fans blowing out. Yeah, I never saw a game at at the Met or, or at, at the uh, the at the Dome. The Dome, yeah. yeah. You know, it it had its quirks, and you know we've got our memories from there, right? You know, the ninety one series and the eighty seven series. You know, the Pucket and the, we we've got our memories in there. It, it, it has a soft spot soft spot in my heart. I'm glad uh, they're out of there. Yeah, I love the new park. I have been there. That's yeah, what... it's. Uh, I think you really had to go to Metrodome to really appreciate Target <laughs> Field, because <laughs> watching a game in Metrodome, it was like, yeah, okay, so we're pretend I'm we're in left field, on the down, right down the line, we're looking at the left fielder. <laughs> you yeah. literally, we have to do this to you know look at home right, plate. The, the it angle, was, uh, the angle. Was, yeah, because oh, yeah, I mean it was built for football, right? You know, it, oh, it was just a shit show, but. So, all right, what else about 76? What else can we dive into? Well, I mean, the, uh, you know, I believe that nothing happens in a vacuum. And, and I'm always, I mean, my previous book, Big Hair and Plastic Grass, was, <laughs> was about, right. was about <laughs> the way. Great title. The, thank you. It was about the way that, you know, that baseball had been this kind of like, you know, just in this bubble for decades and like. You know, like you have no idea that what else is going on in America around it. In the 70s, when the sport and American pop culture kind of collide and all of a sudden you see this, you know, this spillover onto the field. And you definitely see this in 76. uh, But also 76 is just, you know, just as it's a transitional, really important transitional year for baseball. It's a huge transitional year in American culture. Right. It's, you know, uh, in film, you know, this is this is basically a year that begins with Taxi Driver and ends with Rocky. Right. And these are two, you know, both gritty kind of urban dramas, but with very different messages and very Mm -hmm. different endings. And, you know, and Rocky goes on to influence all these films that are made after it, whereas that whole kind of like really downbeat, uh, existentially crushing uh, brand of 70s film, uh, you know, they, they pretty much stopped making those. Right. Um, musically, you've got the punk scene is starting to happen in New York. Hasn't really broken national yet, but that's the Ramones' first record comes out that year. Uh, my roommate plays with Richie, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, awesome. So, uh, so, uh, so that record comes out. Um, you know, one of the big records in 1976 is uh, Boston's first album, which comes oh, out yeah. in the fall. And like both the Ramones record and Boston's record are made for about the same amount of money. Right. Yet they're just like, you know, sonically opposite ends of the spectrum. And um, but but Boston's record really kind of sets the tone for like, you know, this really lush um, you know, super, super clean, uh, you know, hard rock production for right. the rest of the decade. That's like the predecessor. I mean, that's kind of what set the precedent for like, like hysteria. Yeah, it's a, you know? actually absolutely what I was about to say, like Def Leppard, like it's, right. it starts there. Um, uh, disco isn't, hasn't really reached critical mass yet, but it's, you know, starting to happen on the charts with the Bee Gees and Johnny Taylor's Disco Lady becomes like, you know, the first R&B record to sell like a million copies. And, you know, and so so that's happening. Uh, Hip hop is is starting to get going in the Bronx, although nobody outside of the Bronx is aware of what's right. happening. But they're using like Thin Lizzy records to, to like, you know, get the beats and and you know so so there's there's all this stuff going on and and you know all the stuff is happening in new york which 
to the rest of the country, New York is this shithole that's about ready to just fall into the Hudson. Right. It smells like piss. Right. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, you get mugged there, all this stuff. But in reality, like, the, and yeah, you would get mugged there. But, <laughs> right. But in reality, like, there's all this amazing culture happening. So it's sort of like, like, this is the, you know, where the rebirth of New York City begins. And, um, and then on top of it all, you have the bicentennial celebrations, which, um, you know, was kind of a you had to be there thing, but but it's a it's a period that really fascinates me because it's that one period I can remember in my life where the U.S. is not at war anywhere in the world, where like there's a sense of unity for the most part that I've never seen before or since in America, where it's like okay, like we made it through the Vietnam years, that sucked. Like, let's, you know what, like, let's not, uh, you know, let's not talk about that. Let's, let's right. move on and let's, you know, let's remember all the good stuff about this country. And let's, let's remember that, like, you know, we are the country of Ben Franklin and we are the country of the Continental Congress. And, you know, we did start this, you know, this amazing experiment 200 years ago. And, you know, it's had its flaws, but it's kind of worked out. And mm -hmm. and we've, you know, we have all these non-militaristic -milita accomplishments that are really worthwhile. So really, it was about celebrating that and celebrating American history in a way that, you know, you you don't you don't see it now. You don't see people talking about like, oh yeah, you know, Bunker Hill, man, that was that was such a heavy <laughs> moment, and and so, and so like all across America, like every town is having their bicentennial parties. They're painting the fire hydrants, you know, red, white, and blue. They're uh, doing historical reenactments. They're um, uh, you know having pie eating contests, doing all this all this stuff. Baltimore tries to make the world's biggest birthday cake for the celebration and it winds up getting like all the frosting gets rained off in a sudden <laughs> storm and, and then they refrost it and it's overrun by rats oh, and, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so you know there's, there's all kinds of just stuff like that but it, it's it's both it's both incredibly cheesy but there's something really sweet about that right and and so I, I'm just fascinated by this, you know, and having lived through it, you know, I thought it was incredibly cool because at the time I was 10 years old. Uh, that was the year I really got into baseball. So so that was huge. But I was also like this little kid history buff. Like I was always into reading about the revolution. And, right. and like now we're talking about it. Everybody's talking about it. And we've got the Bicentennial Minutes on CBS. Yeah, and Kiss dressed like it. Right, right, right. We've got right, Kiss doing the Spirit of 76. Like like everybody's doing the Spirit of 76. Yeah. Like like every, every magazine is working some kind of star-spangled angle. And, you know, whether it's mad magazine or playboy or you know high time well actually i don't think high times did i think high times was probably the only magazine that did not work because <laughs> they didn't realize what was happening <laughs> <laughs> I, think that, I think that might have been i think that they also like like did sort of uh, i was actually just yesterday looking at the cover of their july 1976 magazine and they've got like the the illuminati pyramid on the cover so oh, that hilarious. that was sort that was sort of their bicentennial thing you know i'm i'm sure there were you know links to ben franklin uh in that article what can baseball learn now from 1976 well that's a really good question i'm not sure i have an answer for you um i mean i think in in a lot of ways you know the people who are kind of apologists for baseball now will look at you know i, I think baseball probably draws twice as many people at least right. as it did in 1976 um you know, it's the um the 70s were were where baseball attendance really started to build i mean it's 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 hard to remember now of course but like you know there was a time when averaging 10,000 fans a game was not uncommon for most mm -hmm. major league teams uh even in bigger markets um you know i grew up i spent my high school years in chicago and before 1984 when when the cubs got hot like you know they would let you into games after school for free like you know by the sixth inning because there was nobody there right like you know come on in and buy a coke you know it's like yeah absolutely please keep, keep going oh, so uh um so what can baseball learn you know i don't know it's it's 
it's I don't think baseball will ever go back to the way it was in the 70s. Right. I think I think there's so much that's different now the way the players are used like the, this whole like notion of like the relief specialist like that didn't mm. exist no. in in the 70s, you know, in ni- 1976 the Yankees have this guy Dick Tidro who, you know, his nickname was Dirt and he was famous for having this like really nasty 5 o'clock shadow and for like he could come in and pitch 5 6 innings in relief, no problem. Mm-hmm. Just like that's what you need all right you know and you would never have that today the whole notion of the closer it wasn't called a closer then it was a fireman yeah that's right and he would cut you know and you wouldn't wait till the ninth inning you know with nobody on to bring him in you know if if your team's in trouble in the sixth or seventh inning you know and and like there's there's two guys on and you know you're up by one run and you need to like put a lid on this you bring in your best reliever and, uh, you know, I think I think so much has changed with the game, with the, the specialization, with the economics, certainly um, the um, you know, I don't I don't I can't see any of that changing for the better. Right. I mean, I think I mean, I think baseball needs a guy like Mark Fittridge. Well, that's you know? that, that's for sure. But but it's it's so. I mean, imagine that Mark Fidrich comes up today. Like I said, he's all over ESPN, you know, at, by the time he's finished with his second start. Um, there's, you know, with Fidrich, there was a lot of um, to do about the fact that he was, you know, basically pitching on a rookie minimum salary and making all this money, you know, for the team every time he pitched. Um, his dad essentially was his agent. Okay. So that you so imagine how well that worked out. So now, like you know, the Mark Fidrich of today would have a Scott Boris or somebody right. like that who would you know immediately be in there like demanding all this crazy money for personal appearances, you know, wanting to renegotiate the contract halfway through the season. It would become a huge distraction for uh, you know for the new Fidrich, um, and. So much of Fidrich's charm was that he was out there doing it because he loved it. And that was something that really resonated with, you know, especially with Detroit's, you know, working class, mostly unemployed uh, fans. But it really, you know, but in this year where everybody's all these players are talking about like, yeah, I'm not signing my contract because at the end of the season, I'm going to be a free agent and make a lot of money. He's he's just happy to be there. Right. Hard to imagine that happening now, and or you know, hard to imagine, or if it did happen, hard to imagine that that attitude would not get poisoned pretty quickly. Do you think that there, uh, the love of the game in the players is still there, like it was back then? I think it depends on the player. I think right. so, I think some of them, yeah, definitely. Um, I think. Um, you know, I think the way that it manifests manifests itself is a little different. I think players are much less willing, for the most part, to kind of let their freak flags fly because right. they, you know, because there's so much money in Jeopardy. There are endorsements. There's, there's, you know, like they don't want to get, you know, if they're in a, if, if, you know, if let's say it's a rookie like Fidrich who comes up and is wacky and on his own trip, like. That would be, you know, I think a player would be a lot more worried now about being sent down and like not earning the shitload right. of money that awaits. Um, well, if they're killing it on the mound, though. Well, yeah, but I mean, like, like look at look at Dontrell Willis, for example. Like, um, and he was not a particularly flamboyant guy, but he had a very flamboyant windup. Right. And that first year, and he's amazing, and he you know has this uh, this great windup. And immediately, like, they, they start going, you know, the coaches are like, hey, you know, you shouldn't pitch like that. And, you know, everything is so by committee. Like, right. well, you know, our, our research has shown that you will do this and do that. So I think there's a lot of, you know, there, there are so many different forces at work that intentionally or otherwise really sap the players of their individuality, of their style, of their groove and, uh, you know, I think um, it's I think mostly you see it's it's the Latino players who still have that attitude and that, right. that flair. But but even then, you, you know, you get a guy like Yasiel Puig, who certainly has that in buckets. But like it's 
you know, there are certainly people who are like, oh man, like he's, he's, I mean, I feel like he's the most exciting player to watch right. today, even when he screws up. It's mm-hmm. just like, you don't know what's going to happen. He's total wild card. But then there are all these other people who are like, like, you know, this guy is a disgrace and he doesn't play the game right. And somebody needs to step on him. And, you know, and, and, uh, um, you know, I think Bryce Harper to some extent as well, although, you know, hmm, he's white, so he doesn't quite get as much uh, criticism right. for his right. uh, his personal flair. What do you think about these uh, stories that have been coming out about Puig, about how, like, his history, and oh, like, he came here on a raft yeah. and all this kind of well, stuff. Well, and all the bribes he had to pay yeah. and, and you know, and the, and the threats to his family. I mean, I, I, I believe all of it. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, uh, um, uh, you know, that there's any situation where, you can somehow get a guy to the majors from this really deeply impoverished land. Um, you know, get a guy who who's you know making twenty six cents a day or whatever, and like get him in a position where he can make twenty six million. Right. Like, like you know, there's going to be sharks everywhere, like looking to help him along, but mm-hmm. they want their taste. And yeah, no, I mean, I'm sure there are all kinds of other stories uh, about you know other. Uh, Cuban ball players who had to go through similar shit, and yeah, and 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 I think also like you know it's it's worth keeping mind keeping in mind when you know you come down on Yasiel Puig for not you know doing this or that right. Mm-hmm. It's like like this guy, you know, I mean he's he is very literally an alien, right? Absolutely, and, and he you know it, this is all new to him, and and you know combine that with you know having an ego, which any really great athlete is going to have and um you know and being young and not particularly you know well versed in you know any kind of culture or you know manners or or way of being beyond what he's used to i don't know you know i think you got to cut the guy some slack and well he missed the the home opener yeah that wasn't good was it was well did you say it was traffic yeah he didn't he didn't leave early enough you know it's like you know and and yeah that's 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 we're in LA. That happens. Right, right. It's 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 like you need to get you need to leave for the ballpark early. You right. know, wherever you're leaving for, you need to leave early in LA. And yeah, that was it. That was a huge fuck up. And uh, Mattingly was right not to play him. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, but also like end of story. Don't be you know Bill Plaschke writing like the, this. You know, somebody needs to you know slap some oh, sense God. into this young man kind of stuff. Oh man, that's that's why I get annoyed with sports writers, and that's why I get annoyed with ESPN. I I don't watch ESPN. I well, I don't have cable, but right. that's besides the point. But you know, it's like you know, mostly one because you know the treatment of hockey. Right. Um, <laughs> but it's just like God, the like you know PTI, and then you got you know around the horn, and just listening to these idiots babble and babble and babble. It's like just shut up and let them play the game. Yeah, and and know? and to inject any kind of uh, morality into the game, you know, and, and this goes to, to the whole steroids thing. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's like, like to be like, Oh, you know, like Barry Bonds is an evil person because he, you know, he, he did whatever he did. It's like, you know what? These are all guys just trying to make it. And if, if, if by, you know, if I could make the bestseller list by like you know banging steroids, I would totally bang some steroids. Right. You well, know? see, my thing with Bonds though is he was a Hall of Fame caliber player before he started yeah. taking steroids. Yeah. You and, know, and it was probably you know, and and pretty obviously his ego led him to do it because you know he, you know, wasn't good enough to be just a, a Hall of Fame caliber player. At the same time, don't you want the guys on your team? to not be content with just being a Hall of Fame caliber player? <laughs> well, I think if you're at that point, it's a little bit different, you know, than being, uh, what, what was that Boone kid that played for uh, played for Seattle? Oh, uh, um, Bob Boone. Bob Boone, yeah. Or bro, was it Brett Boone? Brett no, Boone, Bob, yeah. Bob was, Bob was yeah, his Bob dad. Yeah, Bob was the dad. So, you know, Brett Boone is just a scab second baseman all of a sudden. He comes out and 
hits what fifty home runs, right? Or yeah. like Luis Gonzalez in right. two thousand one as well. Brady, yeah, with Brady Anderson. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that was. I remember looking at the paper, going, "What, Brady yeah. Anderson?" You know, it's like like we had single digits home runs the previous year. Now he's it's like Denny Hawking becoming a power hitter. You know, I mean, yeah, it's it's you know, and 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 look, I'm I'm not a I'm not a Bonds apologist. I'm not I'm not pro steroids per se. I just think like. Like let's let's deal with this for what this is and take the morality out of the uh, out of the equation because that's you know that's a whole other. Well, and then you got these people who are whining about like uh, a couple weeks ago the dude I can't remember it was it was a Yankees player that had the uh, he had pine tar on his on oh his the hand, pitcher yeah the pitcher and then you know they're all like well well that's illegal and that's uh, like, and but managers don't say anything because. All of their pitchers probably right, do, it do it too, right? And and everybody's looking for an edge of some sort. Oh, and, absolutely. And, and and Gaylord Perry is in the Hall of Fame. That's right. And you know, now it's I, I was I was explaining this to someone the other day that the you know just because you throw a spitter doesn't mean you're automatically going to be good at it. Exactly. And, and Gaylord Perry was a genius at making the spitter do what he wants do what he wanted to do. I, I've, you know, I could, you know, wet my fingers and throw a ball and it's not going to go anywhere near where I want it right, to go. Right, exactly. And Don Sutton, uh, Dodger, uh, you know, whose greatest season was in 1976, uh, speaking of which. It all uh, comes back to he, it. He, uh, he, I mean, he, his nickname was Black and Decker because he always had like various tools of the trade right. to help him cut the ball or, you know, rough it up in certain spots. And, you know, and, and there's a... I, I think people are more um, accepting of that sort of thing than steroids because there is an art to it. Absolutely, and I think I agree. You know, and and I would agree as well. I think like you're like, hey, if you can make that work for you, I mean, it's just like you know, throwing a knuckleball. If you can make that work for you, great. It's like Joe Negro when they and they <laughs> they were checking him, and all of a sudden his uh, his nail his file oh. <laughs> you know <laughs> flew out of his ble- his back pocket. He shows up on Letterman the next night, and he had a utility belt on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's classic yeah, shit, man. No, it's great. And, you know, and, and and that's that's the that's the stuff I love, and and that's you know so so much of this book you know is about that kind of things where where it's like you know the, these these incidents on the field, these stories like that to me is much more interesting than like getting into you know crunching the advanced stats or you know or talking ad nauseum about steroids or right. other performance enhancing drugs. It's like, you know, like the game that happens on the field, the stuff that happens, you know, like the fights in the clubhouse, right. the, the, um, you know, the, the, the owner kind of inserting himself into the picture where he's not, not wanted. Like th- this is, this is all, this is all the shit I love. And so I really kind of packed uh, Stars and Strikes full of as much of that as could fit. I cannot wait to read it. Uh, when does it come out? It comes out April 29th. Okay. And uh, all your regular booksellers, Amazon. Yeah, it's on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Uh, if, uh, you know, it's it's coming out through St. Martin's Press. So if, if your local bookstore doesn't have it, they can certainly order it for you. Absolutely. And uh, you have a website? Yeah, bighairplasticgrass.com. Also, I'm on Twitter, Big Hair Plast Grass. Yep. And uh, and there's a there there are Facebook pages both for Big Hair and Plastic Grass and for Stars and Strikes. So look those up and get your daily dose of uh, '70s baseball awesomeness. And you are going to be out on a book tour, also. Yeah, um, I'm going to be doing a couple of event, uh, three events in LA this uh, um, in May, uh, May 3rd at the Allendale Library in Pasadena. Um, May 15th at Jocks or Dailies, which is a sports bar in Culver City, and May 17th at Skylight Books in Los Feliz. Okay, and then you're you're actually getting out across the country too. Though, yeah, right? I'll be I'll be doing some uh, some stuff in Chicago uh, both in June and August. Um, I'm uh, I'm actually getting married June 22nd, and my uh, bride to be, bless her heart, uh, has consented to make the first part of our honeymoon be um, my book promotion tour. <laughs> so, awesome. so we're getting, you know, so we're we're getting married, and then like the next day we'll be in Philadelphia eating cheesesteaks and, uh, oh, and promoting. I'm so jealous. Yeah. Don't go to any of the two big ones. Yeah, though. that that's what I've heard. It's like like you're better. There's so many better ones to go to. Yeah, than that. that's that's what I've heard too. I've never been there. Nor have I. So I'm. 
really looking forward I'm to this. Jealous. Are you going to run the stairs and do the whole Rocky thing, too? Uh, yeah, probably not. <laughs> walk, walk the stairs and do the whole Rocky <laughs> that, that might be a little more yeah. my speed. Uh, but then we're going to hit We're going to hit New York, uh, doing a thing at uh, Manitoba's Bar, which, you know, one of my, my favorite dives in, in the East Village. Uh, I got an invitation to read at Cooperstown, so we're going to oh, go wow, up there. Oh, wow, that's badass. Uh, and go, go up to, and I'm still working on solidifying something for Boston, but that's, that's going to happen as well. That's awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, Dan Epstein, you are welcome anytime you want to come back. Dude, this was, this was a blast. Uh, I'd be, be uh, happy to return. I would love to have you. We'll, we'll talk when you get back from your book tour, and we'll uh, we'll make it happen anytime. Sweet. So you just say, Izzy, I want to do the show. All right, cool. Come on. Let's <laughs> I got something do I want to talk about, man. That's right. The book is Stars and Strikes, Baseball in America. In the bicentennial, in the bicentennial summer of 76. That's right. Check it out. Um, check out rockstarleatherworks.com. Get yourself a leather band or a watch that is just badass. I'm going to show Dan mine here in a second. Watch. I'm going to show him my watch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's make that real clear. Yes, real clear. Uh, ha- uh, hairballonline.com. They got some big dates coming up. And, of course, check out the KISS podcast, Three Sides of the Coin. I'll get you in touch with those guys, too. I think you would have a blast on that one. Have you ever heard that show? I'm sorry, I was just spacing out. No, three, have you ever heard the three sides of the coin? No, part? I haven't. Oh, uh, dude, you will, you'll love it. You'll absolutely. I'll get you in touch with those guys. I think you would have an absolute blast. I will see you next week. Not exactly sure who I have coming in, but I know I uh, Todd Latore lined up from uh, Queens Ike in a couple weeks, and um, we'll see you then. Oh yeah, and check out I got a new uh, sports podcast too that I'm working on. That's not exactly as good as I want it to be. But we get there. So, see you next week. I do love you all. Well.